Jiffy Lou brings us Sam Amick each and every Thursday at 8 o'clock. And what great timing because Sam's piece is out this morning. Hey, uh, On the Sacramento Kings, you can read that at The Athletic. Uh, go to theathletic.com, download the uh, app and so much more. A, a very nicely coiffed, mm-hmm. freshly cut Sam Amick this morning. Good morning, friend. Good morning, gentlemen. You know, it's, it's a rare morning. Uh, we actually did... My podcast already this morning. We don't oh, no. do early morning tapings, so like I'm I'm ready to roll. I'm, I'm I got my hoops hat on. Let's do this. Now, was there? I got to ask. I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but we're happy to promote your podcast. Was Was it early because there's a guest that joined you, or some sort of circumstance? Why did you do it so early? Oh man, now you're gonna shame me publicly. It was early, David. Yeah, because <laughs> I made the unwise choice. To uh, our family's been enjoying doing different events recently, concerts and theater, things like that. So Les Miserables was in town last night, and it was the only night we could get tickets. So naturally, an NBA national writer on the first official night of NBA basketball went to the theater, which meant that we could not pod, uh, you know, like we had planned on initially. So everybody had to get up early so that the Amex could uh, could go have themselves a night. Let, let me just say this here because nobody <laughs> nobody loves trashing you as much as me because we're friends, and I say that with love. But uh, let me just say this. Publicly shaming. You and I are on the same schedule almost exactly when it comes to our children leaving home. Sure. Uh, I think 20 years from now, Sam, I don't think you're going to remember, and I mean this in the most loving way, your dumb podcast from this morning. You know what you're going to remember? <laughs> you're going to remember watching Les Mis Rob uh, with, your, uh, with your two children and your family. So I say, I say cheers to you, friend. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate you. No, it was, it was a good time. Way to do uh, your job. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But no, well, you, we up early. Well, we're in talking about your piece, which I love doing, uh, out today. Uh, and it's I'm on the, that. I, I just got, I'm going to out you now. You know, what? You, text me, you text me these seventh grade humor jokes. Exactly. About your piece. And then you get on the air and you think I'm going to get that out of my head. It's like, just, can you it's, call it the article? I like the fun <laughs> interaction, and, and it is a seventh grade interaction. The uh, your uh, your manifesto, if you will, on the Sacramento <laughs> Kings, along with uh, your good friend Anthony Slater. And uh, in reading it, the, one of the parts that jumped out at me was an anecdote about Kings practice and how Malik Monk thought he got fouled in a scrimmage and he picked up the ball and was yammering at the uh, the the whoever the ref was standing in for not getting the call and and Mike Brown just about lost his mind reverted back to uh, last year uh, in particular the game uh, I think it was game four when the Kings lost yeah. by one and everybody was whining about calls and uh, I, I I think at least it seems the first part of the piece at least the article at least was uh, <laughs> was themed that uh, according to Mike Brown everybody else can get excited around Sacramento but they ain't done crap. They haven't done crap. They're nothing right now. It's all about this season and taking a step up. No, you have it right. Uh, also, congrats on your incredible speed reading abilities. You you texted me like 17 seconds ago asking yeah. me if the story – we've read the whole thing already? That's amazing. I did. It was very yeah. good. It was very well done by Anthony. No, Andy. but you <laughs> – you got it right. Um, <laughs> we, you know, we went in and we wanted to do a big picture thing. Uh, you know, I had uh, I really enjoyed connecting with their group, talked to Monty, talked to Mike, talked to all the key players. Um, but the story quickly kind of for us, it became apparent that it was a Mike Brown focused story. You know, we wrote a big piece in the offseason analyzing the moves they made, the moves they didn't make. But at that time of year, the front office is the focus, obviously, for, you know, the roster building reasons. But now it's time for Mike to decide kind of. You got, you got all these ingredients. What are you going to do with it? And his message uh, from even long before training camp was, and to put it in Demata Sabonis' words, that he essentially deleted everything that the Kings had done uh, other than reminding them that they lost to the Warriors in the first round. Um, so he is giving a lot of tough love these days. The Malik story, I thought, captured that really, really well. There was actually video of that, that that moment. It didn't really make the rounds the way that you would expect on social media, but it is fascinating to watch. I mean, you know, like you said, Malik gets hit. He doesn't play through contact. He kind of brings the action to an end, and Mike loses it. I mean, he yells from across the floor, I'm about to lose my and top if we keep doing mm-hmm. that, SH. Um, and, and the spirit of it is 
we do not have the the kind of the the luxury to not compete every single minute and to play through things and to be tough and to be physical and more specifically in the piece gets into this a lot to be a, a vastly improved defensive team. So the calculated risk that Mike is taking, you know, and he's well aware that it's a risk is I'm not going to just roll this fancy offense out again and try to get back to the playoffs like we did last season. I want us to be a complete team. If the offense suffers a little bit, you know, in the interim, while we figure out our defense, then so be it. But uh, but he is determined to try to get them into contender status. You know, Sam, I think Mike Brown is fascinating. I, you know, taking some of his quotes even from a year ago, um, where he, he'll say stuff almost to speak it into existence. He really was praising, we have two all-stars. We have two all-NBA players, and by the end of the year, there's Fox and there's Sabonis. Um, he said it the other day, to your point on defense, we will not finish 26th or whatever they were defensively. It, it's almost, I mean, he's being strong to the media, I think indirectly or maybe more directly to the team. Uh, how much of his messaging, and I think he even said it in camp this year, everything we do and I say is intentional. Um, it, it really feels like he is, one, a man of his word, but it has messaging directly, indirectly all over the place regarding this team. Yeah, no, I agree. Now, the important thing, guys, and this is where our jobs get kind of funny, is like, all right, you you hear that Mike has got this messaging. You hear that Mike's being pretty tough on everybody. And it's not like we're trying to go around creating any problems for the coach, but part of the inevitable part of the, the job is let's check in with the players. And so, it, you know, the important thing that Kings fans will like to hear is that, you know, we did not run into, like if De'Aaron Fox had told Slater, talk to Fox for the, for the piece, if he had told Anthony, like, yeah, I get what Mike's doing, but you know, it's a little hard or whatever. Or when I talked to Sabonis, if, if he, you know, highlighted the fact that, that Mike needs to, to not crush everybody at the beginning, there was none of that. The two leaders were on board. Even down the line, you look at a Kevin Herter, who I talked to uh, about the situation too. Kevin had times in the preseason. He gets taken out of the starting lineup. You think maybe a guy like Kevin would you know, roll his eyes a bit at, at the level of intensity, uh, and he did not at all. He said he understands what Mike is trying to do. Uh, Monty McNair made the point, like, and we see this with every team every year, there's a push and pull, right? Like you got to figure out you know, how hard can I push without losing guys, um, but it really does seem across the board that they understand the method behind the madness, and so they're willing to buy in. Sam Amick joining us. I, I really do. I mean, I'm going to plug anything Sam does, but I really do want to invite people to, to read this article. It is an extensive article, and you cover so many things from De'Aaron Fox's internal voice uh, growing to signing the pledge for the second straight year. I also don't want to give everything away so people can click on it. Uh, Mike Brown, actually, I'm pretty sure he was – uh, channeling his inner Voltaire. Uh, the, the quote is, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Uh, Mike Brown translated that to, uh, good is the enemy of great. And it sounds like, again, I don't want to over-translate what Coach Brown means, but it really sounds like what he's saying is we uh, we got to step up. N nothing counted last year. That was cute. That was neat. Light the beam. That's fun. I want to win an effing championship. And everybody laughed at me last year when I said we're a playoff team. Uh, everyone's laughing at me now when I say we can win a championship. It sounds like Mike Brown's trying to instill that through that quote and other actions uh, to the team this year. Yeah, he is. And the thing, admittedly, that I love about where he's at um, and he hit on this is that he he's like this kind of, you know, he's at this, this unique place of empowerment, confidence, you know, long life experience, not even just basketball wise. He's a grandfather. Now you hear him talk about his, his grandchild and he, he, you know, he's got his own beam. That's uh that's kind of lighting up. Um, but he just simply is focusing all of his energy basketball wise on doing the right things as he sees it, you know? So he had a, a comment that's at the end of the story guys about how, listen, I'm not going to be the coach of the Sacramento Kings for 50 years. Mm -hmm. Now he said 50. So it's like such a huge number. You just kind of go, yeah. Oh, I get your point, but whatever. And he so said, he, I'd like to though, too. <laughs> yeah, he said he'd like to be right. right. But his point is like, if it doesn't work and they want to fire me in a year or two, fine. Like I'm going to do, if I can look in the mirror, and I feel like I'm doing what needs to be done to get this team to the best place possible. I'm going to do it now quickly. Cause I know we highlighted the monk situation earlier. You talking about Mike Brown's journey. Um, I thought this was interesting nuance that it, it wasn't in the piece. I thought it was too hard to, 
unpack in written form. But when he went kind of nuts on the leak, um, there was a decent group of people along the side of the practice facility that day. One of the guys was Matt Barnes. So Matt was there that day with Steven Jackson. I think they were doing something with their podcast. And what the, the one thought that I had, guys, is that if you remember this time a year ago, you know, Matt was somebody who in the past had been really skeptical of Mike's uh, kind of coaching history. He had him with the Lakers. He questioned his ability to to kind of lead the room back then when Mike was much, much younger. So I thought it was so interesting that Matt was in the room to see this version of Mike, to see this guy who, you know, does not suffer fools, but is not, not in any sort of arrogant kind of puffy chest way, but, but he has got command of the room. He has the backing of the organization. He has the vision and he's just going to go ahead and try to see if he can execute it. And by the way, I, I think, uh, in fact, I know they sat down just to kind of follow your point, Stephen Jackson and Matt Barnes with the All the Smoke podcast. I think it's out right now. I think it was out yesterday, but they sat down for an extended visit with Coach Mike Brown. Um, Sam, to kind of go back to your point on you che checking in on the players. I know Slater did with Fox, and, and you've talked to Herder and others. I, I think that's such an important element. I, I feel like it's all connected as well as it possibly could. The confidence level, the life experience that you alluded to that Mike Brown has – but I know when uh, they were looking for the next coach and it ended up being Mike Brown, De'Aaron Fox was on with Dave and I and literally said, like, I want structure. Like, he was at that point in his career where he'd established himself but still was looking for more, being more of a winner, more more uh, accolades, I guess. And he wanted structure. Maybe Sabonis inherently wants structure. It just feels like this is working perfectly. I don't know how it's going to end but the fact that the two best players kind of are coveting that seems to to work perfectly with Brown style. Yeah, I agree. And now the question is just, you know, is the basketball going to work perfectly? Because sure. it's funny, you know, I mentioned the offseason story that we wrote. As we wrote it, I believed everything we were writing. But in the back of your mind, you're kind of going, OK, the organization is at the time was was really highlighting the Sasha Vizenkov addition, right, as something that. You might not see it now, but this guy is, is very talented. And uh, just because the casual fan doesn't know who he is, that he's going to be an impact player. That might still ultimately prove to be the case, but that does not fit in very nicely with Mike's narrative, if you will, of uh, we got to defend a lot better. So Vesenkov and his defense has been something to focus on early on. Kevin Herter and his defense has been something to focus on early on. Um, the basketball side that is to me going to be really interesting to watch because you can have the vision like Mike does and you can have the plan and you can really push it. Uh, but, you know, do they have the guys who can get this thing done? Last night was a very good start, especially considering the, the schedule they have coming up. They go Warriors, Lakers, Warriors. So getting that win on the road was big. Um, you know, Harrison Barnes looking like, like Michael Jordan for a little yes. while was helpful. Um, so, you know, that's the defense is going to be, you take all the drama away and the, human components, just basketball wise, you know, they were 23rd tied for 23rd in defensive rating last year in the playoffs. They were, their defensive rating was sixth out of 18 teams. Now I know that's a little weird because it's one round versus teams that, that might've gone to the finals, but they were better and they were more physical and they want to be that way all year. So they, they appeared to execute that plan against the jazz. And, and that's going to be something that it's going to be a huge storyline this year. Just jumping off the piece for a second, I wanted to ask you because I've seen a few of your contemporaries make comments to this to this effect at the uh, you know in the in their Kings previews, for example, whether it's ESPN or other outlets. I happen to agree with them, but but no one's closer to the team than you, Sam. The the comments are something to the effect of the front office is in a position to make a win now move, which I expect them to make if it's there this year. I'm just curious if you agree with that, just the general feeling. Yeah, no question. Um, they, they, they hinted at that and not even hinted. They were pretty open about that in that off season story that I keep mentioning when, you know, we talked to the front office for that piece um, more recently when Drew Holiday became available after the Portland Milwaukee trade, the Damian Lillard deal. Uh, I thought it was revealing and interesting that even though it didn't progress or go anywhere, that the Kings absolutely looked into that situation, had interest in Drew Holiday. And it just was a reminder that when big names come up like that, they are going to look at it. Um, now, 
you know, it, it's we don't know who's going to become available down the road. And there's going to be a, a kind of a, a, you know, a relationship where the state of the team is going to matter a lot. If they're out there just balling and looking great, looking elite, then you uh, you kind of handle trade discussions with kid gloves because you don't need guys feelings getting hurt because their names leak out. Um, so they're going to have to walk that line, but they, they, they don't mind sharing with you that anytime a player of any import becomes available, they are likely going to look into it. In your findings too, on this piece, Sam, oh, there I go again. There you go. Yeah. Uh, from the athletic, uh, what do you think the Kings or Mike Brown or those that you talk to his term of greatness is, how do they vision that? I mean, Mike's is, it, it's the, the absolute top of the top it's championship, which is where, um, again, the fun part, we actually talked to Mike on the phone, uh, conference call style, just Anthony and I and Mike. Um, and at the end of the conversation, I said, I know it's a little cliche to ask this, Mike, but just as far as how you see the team at its best, what it's capable of, what's the ceiling here? And, and the quotes in the story, he said, I, I really believe that we can win a championship. I do. Now, to his defense, and this nuance is in the story a bunch elsewhere, but he qualified that statement a decent amount. He talked about luck. He's, he's never afraid to say that luck plays a big part, that health plays a big part, that internal growth plays a big part, that you know, uh, quite a few people on the team are going to have to take steps forward. Keegan Murray getting better. Darren Fox you know, playing is like he did last year, but the leadership stuff that we got into – Sabonis, so who I, we didn't really explore this much, but you could really tell, man, that, you know, I know we've talked about his extension a lot, that he's in a fantastic place. You know, I think largely because of that extension, he's really committed and, and feels secure and stable here and uh, and is kind of supporting Mike and, and lifting De'Aaron up. So all those things would need to happen, um, you know, but to Monty McNair's point, this is what I think makes the regular season so interesting in the West from the Kings and beyond is that the West is so loaded that the, the Monty said, I think, you know, we could win the West or we, we could be fighting for the play-in or worse. And that is probably true. Um, you know, the, the West is, is stacked. So, um, you know, Adam Silver's goal of, of making people tune into the regular season, I think, is, is probably going to be a, a kind of an easy thing to pull off this year. The Athletic Sam Amick joining us. Uh, Got to ask you a non-Kings question. How's the James Harden thing going to hmm. shake itself out? More news yesterday. He showed up uh, apparently to Philly with his bags packed. They said, uh, you know, why don't you just stay, stay home here, Jim? And uh, here we go. Uh, any, any further ideas as to how this thing's going to regress or progress? I mean, he it feels like he has now entered the Marshawn Lynch phase of this saga, which is I'm only here so I don't get fined. Yep. Game checks, you know, north of $300,000 that – he would have lost that I believe he avoids that that uh, that hit to the pocketbook by returning to the team, even though he's not going to play. You know, it is – I equated it this way yesterday to somebody. You know how with the defensive three seconds rule, you, you got to jump out of the paint, you know, and then just kind of like dip your toe back in uh, and play that game of, of just bending the rules in order to not get in trouble. That's kind of what James is doing right now. Let me get back to Philly – for a minute so they can't hit the pocketbook, but I'm not actually a member of the team. Um, I understand that he's extremely upset with Daryl Morey. I don't think it's going to help him get to his ultimate goal, especially by the way, when the Clippers go out and have a fantastic yeah. opener where Russell Westbrook is a plus 30 and, uh, and, and all the pieces seem to fit pretty well. Um, you know, I believe ESPN reported yesterday that the Clippers were kind of putting a pause on their James Harden pursuit. Uh, and that is not good news for James because there is nobody else coming after him right now. Yeah. And not good news for Philly, right? Either for Maury, who's kind of stuck here too. Like, you know, they want as much as they can for him, but that Sam just seems like that value is just dropping by the day. Yeah. And I know Daryl's hope without question was that James would see the value in playing and that he would, that would be the thing that ultimately got him, where he wanted to go. Now, the problem is, and this is just a life thing, when you lose trust in somebody <clears throat> like James has lost in Daryl, then you just don't believe them. So I think James's view is, uh, no, that's BS. You want me to play because you think after I play for a while and if we win a couple games that I'm just going to settle down 
and then you're going to get what you want, which is for me to be on this team, you know, in the last year of my deal because he opted in um, and he doesn't want Daryl to get what he wants. Uh, it is it is absolutely a test of wills, a test of stubbornness. Um, and, uh, and and I don't know where it's going or what James's strategy is right now. You know, we'll see tonight. Philly has Milwaukee. Um, they're still a pretty good team. You know, Tyrese Maxey looks like a guy that that is about to take another jump. Um, so, you know, that could add even more pressure to James, I think. Like, what if they just start stacking up W's without him? Uh, but we'll see what happens. Uh, we'll finish here. I'll give you my uh, impossible to answer question of the day. Is there a scenario, Sam, where Adam Silver and the Players Union and the Sixers are confronted with a serious issue? For example, James Harden reports. Uh, James Harden plays like uh, he's got money on the other team. He is out of shape. He uh, is disinterested. He's turning the ball over seven times and a half. Maybe not blatantly, because that would be easy. Maybe not blatantly tanking, but certainly not giving it their all his all and then philly all of a sudden wants to go in and and do something contract wise because james is going against the integrity of the game is, is there a scenario you see where this might turn into something else yeah i don't think anything's off the table right now including uh you mentioned adam silver you know at what point you, i've already heard plenty about the idea that the league office and adam are not thrilled about this storyline they would like it to go away so that pressure typically in terms of the hierarchy that gets applied to ownership, you have Josh Harris here who has to decide how long am I going to support Daryl's approach strategy wise, uh, or, you know, at some point does Josh step in and say, take whatever's on the table for James. We got to get him out of here. Um, it, it's not, it's one of those things. It's funny. The NBA never wants to admit they love the drama. They love these types of stories because they do bring eyeballs. But I think they want these types of drama. Now that the season has started, now it's like, well, now it's a problem because now we got to focus on hoops. And we don't. I don't think they like the James Harden story anymore. I think they would like it to go away. They would like him in a new jersey so people could then see how interesting that looks. Um, and I think that pressure is probably going to con continue and to your question, as far as James, you know, nobody, I think even his own camp is entirely sure what he's going to do next. Go to the athletic.com or download the athletic <laughs> app. It is a, uh, it's a lot of information on the Sacramento Kings, a lot of great insight. It is a long piece, but it is a piece that is absolutely worth it. And it belongs to Sam Amick and his friend, Anthony Slater. I suggest you check it out very, very soon. Sam, appreciate you as always. Thanks guys. See you soon. Yeah. Thanks, Take Sam. Care. That's uh, Sam Amick. And